I'm Mike Farrington, welcome back to my shop, aka The Boardroom. In this video, I'm going to make tube socks cool again by adding them to a small round side table. And over the years, I've built this table probably more than 10 times. Each time I do it slightly different, but the general design stays the same. And I think one of the things that I like most about this design is that it is flexible. It's real easy to scale this table up and make it coffee table size or shrink it down and make it a tiny side table as I've done in this video. Also the joinery is flexible. In this build I'm going to use what's called a bridle joint, but a traditional mortise and tenon or even a dowel joint would work just fine. And lastly, the leg detail that I refer to as socks can be altered. That can be painted on or dyed, or it could be put on with veneers as I will do in this video, or it could be removed altogether. And later on, I'll talk about how I came up with this design and how building uh, the same piece multiple times has helped both my design skills and my woodworking skills. At this point, I have two boards glued together that will become the top. While that's drying, I grab a couple of offcuts, I flip them around and I try and determine where I can cut each part from that particular board. And I cut the four legs from the outer edges of the boards where the grain is straighter, and the stretchers are cut out of the center of the board. The grain's not quite as straight, but because they're under the table, they won't really be seen. And my milling process starts at the bandsaw with a rough cut, then I head to the joiner and I straighten an edge, then I bounce back over to the bandsaw where I rip my parts to width, then I head back to the joiner and planer for final dimensioning. Now that I've milled the stretchers and the legs, I turn my attention back to the top. It's been in the clamps long enough, a few hours, so I get it nice and flat at the wide belt sander. Then it's over to the table saw where I make it perfectly square. Once square, I add a couple of dados to the underside of the top. I make sure to use all four edges as a reference for the dados. This will ensure that they're perfectly centered. I size these dados a little small. The stretchers almost fit in, but not quite. And I do this so that I can come back later with a hand plane and tune up the fit. My original plan was to leave the edge of the table at 90 degrees. After making the first cut, I wanted to spice it up a little bit. So I tilted my table about 10 degrees and made a second cut. With the dados cut and the tabletop in circular form, the top is done and I set that aside. I turn my attention back to the legs. Just throwing together a quick and dirty tapering jig. I always make these so that the bottom of the leg is equal in width and thickness. So in other words, the pad or foot of the leg is a square.
I absolutely love making jigs like this. They only take 10 or 15 minutes to make. And what's cool about them is it, once I'm done using them, I could pull the clamp off of them and then label it, hang it on the wall, come back to it, and I could make the exact same part several years down the road. And here I'm just working on the splay angle. The taper on the legs is about one and a half degrees. I end up going with a two degree splay angle. So this means the outside of the legs are splayed open about a half a degree. And I'm not too concerned with accuracy, so I just chop this angle at the chop saw. And this is a critical point. I'm adding that same two degree cut to the tops of the legs, but because the tapered face is referencing the saw, I'm actually only taking a half a degree off the top of each of the legs. This will be important for the bridle joints that I will be cutting later. Here's a pro tip. Anytime you're using a table saw to cut joinery or really any power tool for that matter, use a marking knife to scribe a line. This will prevent any blowout. All right, next I get started on cutting the bridle joints. And I don't really know what the two parts of this joint are called, so I'll just call them the mortise and tenon for the rest of this video. And I cut the tenons first. The exact size isn't real critical. I'm shooting for a fat quarter of an inch. And here's where those two degree end cuts pay off. I use the end cut to reference the surface of my table saw. This ensures that the shoulder of the tenon is cut at two degrees, so there's virtually no setup. And I think the only downside to this technique is there's a gap between the backing board on my tenoning jig and the workpiece. So I just add a third clamp to make sure that the piece is very securely clamped. Next, I move on to cutting the mortises, which are on the legs. And this is again where that two degree angle pays off. Had I not cut that two degree angle on the ends of the legs, the shoulder of the tenon and the bottom here of the mortise wouldn't line up properly. And after cutting the mortises on all four legs, the last step is just to make a small fence adjustment and clean out the waste in between. And it's been my experience when cutting bridle joints, you don't want the fit too tight. It will actually cause that mortise to open up a little bit if you have to force the pieces together. One last joinery task, and that's a half lap on the stretchers. All right, uh, which way do these go together? No, no, not like that. Uh, wait, uh, it, uh, ah, there it is. Anytime I'm doing real simple joinery like this, I don't take the time to make a test piece. My actual work piece is the test piece, and I just make conservative small adjustments and I creep up on the fit. And once again, I want the fit on this joinery to be a little too tight. This way, a couple of swipes with a hand plane, and it'll fit just the way that I want. Because I'm using a table saw blade with an alternate top bevel, I get small peaks and valleys in my joinery cuts, so I like to come back with a chisel and a hand plane and clean those up. So 
So here's what I look like when I'm trying to work up the courage to cut some gaboon ebony, which is what I'm going to be using to make the socks on this table. That, and I'm trying to figure out what height I want to have them at. Once I work up the courage, I cut some veneers to a fat 1 16th of an inch. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that I would talk about how the design of this table came about. As a cabinet and furniture maker, I often have end cuts off of boards and I have narrow rips off of boards that are left over from building face frames or other cabinet projects. So one day I had a whole pile of lumber laying around that was just going to go into the trash. The pieces weren't wide enough to make face frame parts out of or door parts and they weren't long enough to be of really any use. So I set about making an end table that would use up those scraps as efficiently as possible. This is the design I came up with. So after making the first two of these tables, I had them sitting there in my shop and I had a meeting with a designer that day. And the designer came into my shop and we were talking about a project and saw the table sitting there and liked them. So I was able to sell the first two pretty quickly, which is nice. And fast forward a few years, and I'd had the opportunity to build this table a couple of more times. And each time I would do it slightly different. Sometimes I wouldn't use bridle joints. Sometimes I'd use just mortise and tenon. Uh, sometimes I would paint the legs black. And then kind of towards the end here, the last few that I've made, I decided the ebony details at the bottoms of the leg was a really nice addition. So the design as it sits here today is something of an evolution and I'm sure if I get the opportunity to build another one of these tables in the future, it'll change again. And building the same piece multiple times has certainly helped my design skills. Building something, analyzing whether I like it or not, and then being able to build it again and change a small detail really gives an interesting perspective to design. And it's definitely helped me become a better woodworker. To all you woodworkers out there, how many times have you built a piece and the minute you're done with it, you tell yourself, boy, if I ever built this again next time, it will be perfect. Well, building the same piece multiple times has helped me refine my woodworking. It would be much better to clamp these veneers in between my bench and the workpiece, which I'll use that technique later. I'm doing it this way because it was freezing cold in my shop and I have these hanging over a couple of space heaters. So I'm going to trim the excess using the same router table technique that I used earlier. To do this, it's important that those veneers not be sticking up at all past the surface of the leg. Thin veneers, and especially ebony, have a tendency to chip out, so when trimming this, I take a couple of light passes. During this project, I was listening to some music, and the song Daughter came on by the band Pearl Jam. And I don't know if you get this or not, but when I hear that song, it takes me back to a very specific place and time in my life. A good time, a good place, but for whatever reason, that particular song is very much tied to a specific memory. And I remember hanging out with a couple of buddies listening to that song, and we thought we were all cool because we were teenagers and we were wearing flannel shirts. But I remember singing that song with them, and if you've heard any of my musical stylings, you know how awesome that must have been. But it was just a really fun moment in time, and I'm really glad that that song brings back that memory so vividly. So if you're in the mood to travel back in time, give Daughter a listen. It sounds as good today as it did back in 1993. I drew a pencil line on my shooting board to help me estimate this angle, but getting this angle spot on isn't super critical. What is super critical is that that cut be very straight and also 90 degrees relative to the face of the veneer. At some point during the day, a cold front blew in and it started to snow like crazy and the temperature must have dropped 25 or 30 degrees. 
wood glue doesn't work well below about 50 degrees so I switched over to polyurethane glue and this glue is good down to about 40 degrees it just has a much slower cure time at that temperature and overall I really like polyurethane glue it has many characteristics that I really like but it has two things that I don't like about it parts tend to want to slip it's a really slippery glue that's what I'm checking here to make sure that I didn't move anything the other thing I dislike about it is it's hard to get off your hands if any gets on your hands it's gonna be on there for about two days once the glue is cured I use a spoke shave a block plane and a smoothing plane to prep the parts for glue up After running about nine different space heaters at full blast for a couple hours, I get the temperature in my shop back warm enough to glue this sucker together. Clamping bridle joints together is a little different than, say, a traditional mortise and tenon. I like to use a pinching force to make sure that the joint is tightly clamped. So I just wiggle the two parts until the joint is closed, and then I throw a few C-clamps on, and that's all it takes. And the last step before finish is to clean everything up with a smoothing plane and some sandpaper. And the finish I'm applying is called Osmo, and I really like the way that Osmo looks on cherry. I apply two coats to everything, I add a third coat to the top, and I like to just smear some on, let it soak in for a few minutes, and then buff it off. Overall, I'm really pleased with the end results. This table is quick and fun to build, but it has just enough detail to add some challenge and make it interesting. And I think those small details really help a project like this stand out. And I'll have plans available for sale on my website, so if you're interested in building one of these and you want to work from a set of plans, check out MikeFarrington.com. Thank you very much for following along. Till next time.